to another episode of the Renegade Variety R podcast. Today we are talking with Stefan Kinsella, who uh, we have been able to speak to before. He is a patent attorney out of Houston who wrote a fantastic essay, and a number of them, one of them called Against Intellectual Property. Uh, on our last episode that we had with him, we did talk about that subject, but today I want to talk about um, argumentative ethics, which was presented by Hans Hermann Hoppe, and East Apple, which is an idea that kind of works off of that. Uh, an idea that was kind of come up with by uh, Stefan Katsella. How are you doing today, Stefan? Good. How are you guys doing? Very good. good. Uh, so, Stefan, uh, I actually read out one of your articles recently for one of our episodes just so I could even better understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, can you tell me a little bit about East Apple and what that means? Yeah, you read out my first, uh, I think, 1991 or two recent papers article, um, which I later expanded and built on and uh, – two longer pieces in uh, a law review and in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. Um, that idea was – you know, I was heavily influenced by Rand, and I was becoming more anarchist, and I say around 88 or 89, I was in law school. I think that was right around the time that Hoppe's argumentation ethics had just come out, and Hoppe's argumentation ethics is, um, is an argument for – a type of libertarian rights, okay? And the argument go is some people call it a transcendental or maybe a meta argument, but the 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 argument is that the way we can know that only libertarian rights are justified is that any attempt to justify anything is always going to occur in the process of some kind of discussion or discourse or argumentation between people. And if there are any norms that is like say values or uh, beliefs presupposed in argumentation necessarily by its nature as an activity that you could never propose anything that would be contrary to that and be consistent. So for example, to take a factual case, you could never argue that argumentation is impossible. I mean, you can argue it, but you'd be incoherent. Or you could never argue that there's no such thing as existence. You could never argue that uh, there are no such thing as other people. I mean if I'm talking to you and I'm denying that you exist… It just makes no sense. You could never deny that there's a difference between yourself and the universe because as Rand you pointed – You are part of the universe. You're part of it, and you're conscious of something. That something has to be something apart from you, etc. Uh, you could never argue against the law of non-contradiction, for example, um, because if you were to argue against the law of non-contradiction, what you're saying is here's what is true. Okay, The law of non-contradiction is false. That's a true statement about the universe. It's a true statement about the universe as opposed to being false. right? So that is the law of non-contradiction, that true things are true, false things are false, and the opposite can't be true at the same time. So there's a lot of things like that that are called performative or practical, practical contradictions or presuppositions of argument. Um, and if you engage in a performative contradiction, you're showing that there's something wrong with what you're doing. Either what you're saying is wrong or your presupposition is wrong. It's one or the other. Um, so what Hoppe did was he built upon the work of his PhD advisor, Jürgen Habermas, a very famous kind of lefty uh, European philosopher and another European German philosopher, Karl Otto Appel, who had argued for something called uh, discourse ethics or communication ethics. Now they didn't come up with libertarian arguments, but what they argued was… Um, well, the, the, the part of it that Hoppe distilled, I mean he ignored a lot of their kind of fuzzy stuff, but basically they said that when you engage in communication, there are certain norms presupposed by all the people that participate in it. And now what they did was they said that this is democracy and supporting each other's life, and then they argued for the welfare state and all this kind of stuff. But what Hoppe said was no, their central insight is good, but he said using Austrian – and say Rothbardian type insights about political economy and political theory, he said um, the norms that are presupposed in argumentation are basically the common sense norms of respecting each other's bodies right, and having to be alive in the first place to be able to argue. And being alive is a practical affair. It means you have to survive in the world by employing scarce means in the world, using them in a productive way just to survive and to get to the argumentation. So that means the people that participate in any discourse are necessarily by engaging in this peaceful, cooperative activity, recognizing each other's rights in their bodies, 
and recognizing some kind of ability to homestead and use resources. Otherwise, we'd all be dead and we wouldn't be able to argue. Now, um, the, the, the rights in each other's bodies comes about because the nature of argumentation is I'm trying to persuade you of my proposition by the force of reason alone. I'm not coercing you into accepting it. I'm not saying, Carlos, if you disagree with me, I'm going to bash you over the head with this brick because if I was, that wouldn't be a genuine argument. I'd just be coercing you. Okay, so to the extent there's a genuine discourse going on, the participants are necessarily respecting each other sort of as separate people, right? and as equal people in a sense, right? as having similar rights in a sense because we're humans. Uh, so in other words, I'm claiming for myself the right not to be aggressed against, but the only reason I could get for that, and if we're engaged in argumentation, I have to give a reason… The only reason is because I'm a human or I'm a rational speaker or whatever. But whatever that reason is, it's going to apply pretty much equally to the other person. So in this way, Hoppe argues that um, basically anytime you argue for anything that's not libertarian, which is basically what he calls socialistic, any kind of institutionalized aggression against private property claims, that that is incompatible with the norms presupposed by anyone… Engaged in peaceful argumentation in the first place. So what he's trying to show is a contradiction proof. He's trying to show that anytime you argue for anything except for libertarianism, you're going to contradict yourself. You're going to contradict the implicit presuppositions of argumentation, which is a peaceful human activity. So that's argumentation ethics. And he had um, he had a paper in 1988 in Liberty Magazine. Which caused a lot of stir. A, a good dozen or so prominent libertarian thinkers at the time commented on it, including Rothbard, <coughs> Tim Verkala, uh, David Gordon, Leland Yeager, uh, David Friedman, um, and others. And um, and uh, I was fascinated by that, and I've, I've, I have been ever since then. And he elaborated on it in other books. So that's argumentation ethics. And I think in Rothbard, what Rothbard said was that he, he loved the idea, and he thought it was a, a big improvement upon his previous more traditional natural rights argumentation – argument for, for rights because this thing is sort of rooted in natural preferences and the inherent features of argumentation, and it basically shows libertarianism can't be denied without contradiction. So it's kind of an iron ironclad solid proof. And that's the theory of Rothbard and Hoppe is one reason people don't like it is they don't like these – what they call knockdown arguments, like people like Nozick, for example. And the, the idea is that a lot of these other theorists, they, they want it to be forever an open field, and um, uh, more of a, it's more of a game for them. And they don't like the idea that you can just solidly prove once and for all this is the le one legitimate norm, even though they agree with it. They just don't want it to be a proof. They want to be well, if you have a proof in ethics, though, then you have to close a philosophy department. Exactly, um, exactly. So, I, <laughs> so, so, that, like, so that's argumentation ethics. Estoppel is sort of my uh, twist on it, which was uh, when I was in law school, I was in contracts class, and there's a um, – I, I think I had just read Hoppe's paper, and I was thinking about all this, and uh, I learned about this concept in contract law, which is called estoppel, which means if you make a representation – during the course of a transaction between you and another person, like you, 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 you say something is true or you say that you're going to do something or whatever, and then later on you try to get out of the contract by saying that, that let's say the other side breached the contract. But to say they breached the contract, you have to make a statement that contradicts what you earlier said. Then you can be stopped from saying it even if it's true because you're trying to maintain two inconsistent positions at once. Um, and there's lots of variations of this rule in the law, promissory estoppel, um, etc. And it just occurred to me that that sort of insight was the basis of the reciprocity inherent in the libertarian non-aggression principle because the non-aggression principle is the idea that you, you may not initiate force against someone else, which means – what it really means is you can use force against someone if they've used it against you. So this is, there's a reciprocity. If someone's being peaceful to you… You must be peaceful to them, but if they have been non-peaceful to you, you can be non-peaceful to them, and I thought to myself, well, the reason is because the guy that has breached the rules of peace that has tried to invade my body or my property with force, the reason it's legitimate for me to retaliate right, or to defend myself with force is because he has no complaint 
because he, he would be a stopped from complaining because he'd be taking an inconsistent position. He would be arguing that um, you don't have the right to hurt my body, although I just performed the action of hurting your body, which meant that he did believe it was okay to hurt other people's bodies. So he's taking two inconsistent positions. He's got to choose if he wants to maintain consistency. So that's the basic idea of estoppel, and then I spin it out in this longer article into – Property theory and punishment and pr the pr proportionality principle and a, a whole bunch of libertarian implications like fraud and threats and uh, things like that. So, um, you know, originally though, I had when I was reading through these these ideas, um, a kind of a concern that I had was that someone could justify social contract theory using this, which. After thinking about it a bit, it was like, well, not, not so much. So basically in the, the idea of social contract, it's um, because you live in this country, you already decided to um, follow these rules that were in place, that are put in place by people before you. Yes. Even though you never really formally agreed to it because you were living here. Therefore, if they impose taxes or anything else, uh, you have to uh, abide by them or thrown in prison because you already f uh, followed those rules. thing is, though, is that, one, there – in in a contract case, uh, you know, it, I don't know. Um, I see, it, I see it, what it, you were thinking, where you were going, but you've just refuted your own uh, exactly. false, false <laughs> criticism. I mean, I don't think that argument works because I'm not yeah. I'm not agreeing with yeah. that. What yeah. I'm stating though is that that's kind of a, a thought that I was having in my own, own mind, which was uh, you never really agreed upon it whatsoever. There was no really uh, a real contract that was ever created either. Well, let's let's distinguish a few things there. I think this argument does resemble some types of what's called contractarianism, not the social contract, but contractarianism or even mutualism. Right? The idea that you know I'm going to respect your rights as long as you respect my rights. That's the basic idea. I mean, that's the idea behind cooperation in society. Uh, so that's sort of like a little contract between you and me, right? Uh, I'm only going to respect your rights as long as you respect mine. So that idea is sort of behind some aspects of contractarianism, which David Gauthier. Uh, has written on and others, um, but the social contract is is not that at all. Um, that's just the idea that there's this mythical hypothetical contract among everyone in society of, of reasonable rules that we would agree to if we could sit down and negotiate. Uh, and John Rawls uh, has something, excuse me, sort of like this too. Um, but it's, it's there's never an actual discussion. There's never an actual contract, and. It's really the, – the, the point here is I think um, the Hoppian argument works and the Estoppel argument works by trying to show where someone is actually making an actual um, logical inconsistency or an actual contradiction in what they're asserting. I'm trying to assert two incompatible things at once, but I don't think that happens in the social contract argument. In other words, it, I, I don't commit any kind of contradiction. So let's say that I own a, a homesteaded farm in America in the virgin wilderness, and then gradually a community forms around me, and they adopt this socialistic welfare state government, and they just come to me one day and they say, um, you know, you've got to leave or abide by our rules. That's basically what this is, and, and then their reasoning is that there's a social contract that people would agree if they were reasonable. And I mean, but I'm like, well, I didn't agree to it, and if I say – you stay off my property. I have the right to defend my property. I'm not asserting any contradiction, so the argument yeah. just doesn't work there at all, and it can't work actually. In fact, they're the ones being contradictory because they are standing upon the notion of property rights in their basic grounding of societal rules, which re require some property rights to exist while they're taking my property rights from me uh, even though I haven't committed any tort or haven't signed any contract and I haven't um, – Taken anyone's property from them, so. So in a um, so, so I, I can let you finish real quick, but uh, I kind of kind of a thought I was having was uh, in your uh, in your paper you brought up that if someone is trying to say uh, I'm Dan and I kill Robert, I go ahead and kill Robert, right? And then I go into court and the justices or anyone else there is stating, okay, well because you killed him, uh, now you have to. Uh, be thrown into jail. Now, if I make the claim that I shouldn't be thrown into jail, that my pro that my life should be protected, uh, that I should not be hurt whatsoever, I'm stating that all these shoulds that should be placed on me 
Um, I'm respecting the fact that human beings should be respected. Yeah, because the reason is because you have to make – if you're making an argument to other people in a forum like that, you can't just – and this is where a Hopper brings Kant in. He calls it universalizability. In other words, any norm that you propose to be accepted as legitimate as a reason for action or as a justification for action in a discussion with other people that you're already treating as some kind of equals, you have to give a reason for that. So if you're going to distinguish between people, you have to have a reason for it. So you can't assert what's called a particularizable rule. All the rules have to be generalizable, which means it has to be grounded. In, if there's a distinction to be made between how people are to be treated, you have to find a good reason for that. That's called something grounded in the nature of things. Um, so I can't just say I assert that you should not kill me. I'm, let's say I'm the bad guy, um, and yet it was okay for me to kill my victim because… It's okay for me to kill people, but not for him to kill people, because everyone's going to reject that argument because it's particularizable. It's not gener it's not it's not uh, universalizable. I, you you can't just arbitrarily distinguish. In fact, if you think about it, failing to give a reason for treating things that appear to be similar this uh, differently. If you if you want to treat things that appear to be similar differently, you've got to have a reason for it. And if you don't give a reason for it, that's the same as giving no reason at all. Which is the same as not engaging in argumentation at all. If you're engaging in argumentation, you are trying in a cooperative endeavor with other reasonable, rational, e fairly equal human beings. You're trying to come up with arguments and reasons that we can all agree are fair and that are grounded in the nature of things that are objectively true or that are at least intersubjectively true, which means things we can both see. So it, you know. The burden of proof is on me to distinguish between my rights and those of my victim, and if I just assert, well, it's okay for me to kill him because he's him and he's not me, but it's not okay for you to kill me because I'm me. All I'm saying is the law should be different for me, right? Yeah. Now, that is not a universalizable rule, and it's not going to be a, a type of rule that can possibly persuade people trying to come to a set of cooperative rules. So that, that, that argument is going to be ruled out of court. So what he's got to say is you shouldn't shoot, shoot me because of the general rule, and, and Kant calls this the uh, – the, uh, uh, the, the, you got to find the rule of the action. You've got to find what is the essential norm that's being stated. If I say you shouldn't kill me, really what other people are going to hear is I'm saying there's a general rule that you should not kill people without a good reason. Right? That's what I'm saying. That's the basis of my claim. But once I say that, I'm admitting that I violated that rule in my previous act of murder. Now, then we can argue about – we can disagree maybe about what does that mean? What, what are the consequences of that once I admit that I'm guilty or once it's established that I'm guilty? But the point of the estoppel argument is to show that it's impossible for the, the malfeasor, the bad guy. It's impossible for him to really coherently object to some kind of treatment or consequence for his act of crime. Yeah, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, actually, what you explained in regards to logical inconsistencies and how people get really annoyed by this, right? Like you don't want a philosophical arg argument that just stops everything and stops the discussion. Um, it reminds me a lot of theological non-cognitivism, and I'm kind of hopping on the screen here, but theological non-cognitivism sort of asserts that that's my cat, <laughs> <laughs> sort of. That's, that's so, what it asserts? So it, well, no, it proposes you know, that you can't claim the existence of God because you know he's everywhere at one time and yet outside of space and time. So you're being logically inconsistent and those two ideas are incompatible and so therefore he does not he she it does not exist. Yeah. Um people get really pissed off about the argument <laughs> obviously. Well, but uh, so well speaking of cats there's this uh, you we can, you can make this a logical thing. There's two types of people. People who like cats and people who don't, right? <laughs> I think he I think Heinlein said that. Um <laughs> No, I, so the danger of what you're talking about is true. There, there are quite often um, uh, inconsistencies made in, in argument, and that f that flows somewhat from just people being amateurs or, or not being clear in their definitions ahead of time, right? Or sometimes it flows from other things that are more pathological or more dishonest, like they, they sort of know they have a weak case, so they want to obscure the waters, um, or they want – Maybe they don't. 
or maybe they don't know that they have a weak case. They're, maybe they don't. That's they right. believe maybe. I mean, okay. Especially when it comes to the religious thing, right? Because what we're discussing right now when we're talking about ethical systems, we're trying to figure out a logical system that can explain uh, the non-aggression principle or uh, just trying to explain ethics in general. But whenever you talk about religious ethics, it comes from a completely different place where the morality provided by the, um, the God, in this case, is contradictory uh, to what he actually does. So God says, don't kill people, and then he goes ahead and he floods the entire world. Um, God says, you sh again, not to kill people, and then commands Moses to... Invade, uh, no, he kills, tells Abraham to kill uh, his son, right? Or Isaac his son, or and which is funny, because I was talking to someone the other day, and they said, oh, well, then he said not to kill him. It's like, well, he's still a dick, isn't he, then? Well, it's pretty... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> so the, the, like, the, part of the lesson was that, with you, man. Know, before he re rescinded the order, then the... Uh, the uh, uh, Abraham was supposed to uh, listen to the order, right? And he w he would have been within his rights to comply with the order to kill his son. Yeah, but, it, but the but this, the whole tale is still really inconsistent. The idea that he's testing his faith, right? Well, if this deity knows all and sees all, clearly he understands everyone's faith. So there's no need to ever test. Well, it. Well, what about the uh, the? I mean, look, I, I had this long talk with Jeff Tucker the other day. Uh, I mean, I'm not a believer. I don't know if you guys know, but I'm not. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not anti-theist, I guess, anymore, but I, I don't adhere to it. But I, Jeff Tucker is a good friend of mine, and uh, we, we were talking about um, the uh, – <laughs> yeah, I mean he's Catholic. I, oh, if all Catholics came out like that, it would be yeah, great. Yeah, well, he's very tolerant and very open, and we, he's honest about things. And we talked about this the, the, uh, the, the tempting of Jesus in the desert, and I said, well, presumably Lucifer was in – he was in heaven earlier, so he was like at the right hand of God. So he knew what was going on. He knew that God was the, the leader of all things, right? I mean, the ruler of the universe. And he also knew that God was this weird Trinity thing, God, which is another inconsistency, right? God is yeah, three in one. But he, so he knew that Jesus was God, right? So he's tempting Jesus in the desert by offering him, I don't know, to be king of the earth for a while or something, something kind of secular. And I'm thinking, well, first of all, Jesus could take it if he wanted it. He's God. So what is he offering Actually, him? Yeah. And, and not only that, it's like so. What did so? Why was why was Satan tempting Jesus? What did he think would? What was the best possible outcome from his point of view? That Jesus would say okay, and now what happens? Yeah. Part of the Trinity splits off and fights the other. Well, what what was fascinating about Satan is that Satan is a representation of atheism in the sense that if he, Satan try does questions, right? He's questioning based off of. Um, logical inconsistencies, or just trying to kind of be like, I don't know how great your framework is. I mean, because because again, again it, part of it is is a temptation. So if I am an atheist and I go up to say a believer and I bring up like questioning God or why doesn't God prove Himself or anything else, they have a perfectly good answer. You're not supposed to question God. You're not supposed to tell God to do certain things. God knows all. So being rational, being um, inquisitive, inquisitive in regards to these things. You're being a Satanist. Well, you're being you're, you're you're acting in the same way that that that, uh, that Satan did. I mean, it's, it's it it comes from Adam and Eve, uh, you know, Eve going against going against the, the the commands of God. She went to the tree of knowledge. Yeah, well, I, which is you know, I, I, never, it's I never heard that uh, Satan represented atheists. I guess I could see that. Um, but by the way, uh, that does not necessarily true. It's just kind of a thought that I've had. It, maybe it, I, don't I mean, know. I, I, I could could be totally to totally off guard in that. But the thing is, those it the use of reason is not something that is considered virtuous within the Bible. Martin Luther, of course, spoke of that later on, where he stated that that reason isn't something that's supposed to be held as virtue, only faith. You're not supposed to question God. Well, this, this is another example. I mean, and not that we're getting on a religion tangent here, which I guess that's cool. is yeah, fine. Yeah, Fire, Sorry, it's fine. Variety, variety. It's fine variety, with me, but the, yeah, um, yeah renegade, renegade and variety. Um, so I mean, this whole faith thing. I mean, I, go, I, I hear my religious friends go back and forth on this all the time. So they will, they will say, well, Everyone's religious. You're religious too. You just believe in libertarianism or whatever. I'm like, well, but that's equivocation because, you know, they're trying to use the word in different. And they say the same with the thing with faith. They say, well, you have faith that the sun will rise tomorrow, and so everyone has faith. So they're using these words. They never define faith. If you yeah, do, if you try to define faith evidence. clearly, say, as far as I can tell, you guys say that 
if I have evidence for or a rational deductive proof of God, then that's not faith. That's just reason or evidence. So you claim that you should believe in God for other reasons, which is faith. So as far as I can tell, faith means the belief in something with no reason or evidence whatsoever. And that's yeah. what they yeah. believe in, but when you point that out, they freak out, and they say, oh, you're, caric you're caricaturing our views, and it's not fair. You're giving a straw man. And I'm like, well, but you're engaging equivocation because you're trying to say that if I accept the law of gravity for the purpose of an experiment, I have faith, and so I can't criticize you for having faith. And right. it's like, well, that's not the same sense of the word. But anyway, um, there, there is something I would say here um, on the uh, on the on the arguments for, uh, say, rights and ethics that are embodied in religion. I, I do believe that religion is a is a is the outgrowth of a primitive philosophy. It was the kind of primitive attempt to understand the regularity of things, and also morals. Right. So, the sun comes up. What's behind it? The sun god. You know, and we finally refine these laws, and yeah. Newton arises, and we know a lot more. Um, and then also, these things ingrain themselves in culture, and of course, the common sceptical, normative, and moral rules that society out tend to get embedded in the in the in the in the, in, the uh, in these religions. So, the one thing I would say good about religion is that it still does encode in sort of this kind of weird form a lot of practical morals. Like honesty, don't hurt other people, etc. Well, I think Wait, I think it, I think, it, it, I think it encodes a lot of really improper. It does. Morals it does. Well. It's not consistent. I yeah. agree. It, but it it carries that within it to some extent. Like, and you you see this when you, the defenders of uh, radical Islam, not the defenders of radical Islam, the people that object to the uh, criticism of Islam as being a bunch of terrorists, right? They'll say, "Oh no, it's a religion of peace," right? So now they're focusing on the part that. We all kind of agree, common sense that we agree with the peace part, right? Yeah, but except the fact that the Quran states how to punish people about 350 times, and it says well, peace very rarely. But honestly, yep. though, you stated you stated right. that and instilled like a some kind of moral code. If Bob Saget went on TV, I'm just gonna bring up Bob Saget because Full House, I believe, is a me better moral tale than the Bible. Um, he never told the Olsen twins to, you know, he never tried to kill one of the Olsen twins or um, or set people ablaze for questioning him or any of those other things. Uh, if Bob Saget went on TV and said uh, you should rape these people or you should hold these people as slaves or you should kill these people, and then he followed up with, oh, and be good. You'd go, well, that guy's just fucking crazy, and we shouldn't really sure. hold any sure. of the things that he's stating as being rational or valid. But we do it whenever it's really old, right? So we look at a book that's old, and we go, okay, we'll give it some validity, even though it's incredibly Stone Age and disgusting. And, of course, Christians will uh, state, well, it's contextual. It has to do with the time. It was, it was a product of the time. Well, guess what? The time, according to God, has been billions of years, Okay. I mean, think about the universe. It's billions of years old. There's multiple solar no, 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 no. systems, the, the multiple universe. Eight, eight, multiverse. Years old. What are you talking about? I was gonna say, according to God, yeah, six thousand. Well, no, it, of years. course, right? So it's so it's this large, encompassing thing that is absolutely beautiful and magnificent, where stars have exploded to be able to create us. But for some reason, God's up there going, "Don't masturbate," <laughs> and God's following the ridiculous customs of the time, like uh, "Don't eat shellfish," uh, "Kill a pigeon." Whenever a woman menstruates, I mean, this is all I never crazy. Heard that one. that one sounds like a crazy law that they pass in Massachusetts yeah. or something. Just, yeah, just, yeah, it's true. Just read around Exodus, Leviticus, and you'll find some interesting stuff in there in terms of. Well, I mean, if yeah, you believe that there's a God who was up there before time, whatever that means, I still don't know what that even means before time, and he was, I guess, he was bored, so he created the universe to have a bunch of plaything, quasi sentient beings that would worship him. That's a type of Insane meta meta masturbation that's even worse than you know. I mean, <laughs> you didn't do what I said to do. Yeah, it's like a what? universal porno or something, right? Yeah, yeah and was, and uh, <laughs> speaking of porn, anyway, uh, I, I won't go into that subject in a little bit up here, but uh, no, um, it's just all the characteristics We're of God. We're going to hell, by the way. I mean, we we just doomed ourselves to hell. Or, or, well, Man, this is nothing compared change, to the stuff change, I did in yes, college. You change it to the vocabulary and you say Hades and <laughs> okay, you know. Okay. Yeah, we're same difference. That's where we're going. But uh, but the thing is, though, is, is that all the characteristics of God, whether it being timeless, whether it being uh, like infinitely uh, infinite knowledge, uh, infinite length, all these things are all meaningless terms. They're meaningless jargon. And the 
the contradictions held within the biblical God are massive, whether it be that he's just and good all the time, that he's basically uh, all-knowing and never changing, which means that he cannot have emotions, then why is he pissed off whenever he decides to flood the entire world? Not only that, and as uh, Mises points out, if, if there was an unchangeable, if there was an omnipotent, omniscient God, he couldn't act because acting re- yeah. implies that you're un- un- unsatisfied with the current state of affairs. But God, if he's perfect, would never have an unsatisfied state of affairs because that would imply he had been imperfect in letting it get to that point. Furthermore, acting requires scarce means, and to God, if he's omnipotent, there's no scarce means. So literally God could never act according yeah. to uh, – uh, What really sucks is that when you bring up this logic stuff, it generally doesn't work no, it doesn't. very they well just when say, it comes no, to – They say, no, no, pe- that's human action. God's outside of lo- the rules of logic. I'm like, oh. Yeah, and then I, well, I guess why the hell are we talking about the existence of God if it has nothing to do with logic whatsoever? It's an emotional thing, right? Though, because saying, because you don't be, you don't go to God or you don't start believing in God due to logical reasons unless it's some kind of like weird deist thing where you fall into it for a second and go, well, there had to have been something that started yeah, everything. Yeah. I was going to say, well, kind then of, who started God? I respect the yeah, that's not that's not completely unreasonable. I agree. That is sort of a reasonable, kind of uncertain fallback position. I'm not sure. It seems like. It's still like yeah. it's still like oh well then who yeah. created God yeah. oh I, I don't because God is infinite why well, so is Donkey Kong um, or so is other terms that I can just throw out. Well, actually, if you think about it, the, the original what was it the, I don't know the Greek idea about his turtles all the way down that actually makes more sense because at least they accepted the infinite regress right <laughs> his turtles all the yeah. way down it's just some because uh, no one really believes that his turtles all the way down so you're kind of admitting that we can't figure it out and we're just going to accept reality as it is. Right. Or we can accept the nation of Islam where we're still on a flat earth and then you know mixed with a thousand other things. Let me, let me mention one other <laughs> that thing just, that's that interesting about a religious yeah. – um, the, the appeal to religion or uh, in terms of natural rights. And um, one objection that most libertarians would have to the modern conception of rights is it's, it's called legal positivism. It's the idea that – there's no inherent rights. We can't really prove anything. Everything's subjective, and the only way we can know for sure what rights we have is what the Supreme Court says basically or what the government says. So the modern conception of rights is positivistic, we say, legal, legal positivistic. It's the idea that you have to have a sovereign that announces the rules that we abide by, and then the, if you go back in time a little bit, that used to be the king. right? So it was the idea there was – but at least the king had a divine tie to God. But – so one good thing about libertarians is that they reject the idea that there are no immutable standards or no principles. We, we believe that there's a, a framework that we can rationally come up with of good and right, a good and wrong, right? of, of what's, what rights we have and what you should and shouldn't do, what social norms we should have to govern society, what you should comply with, what you shouldn't, and then whatever those are. Which we can figure out by our minds and by discourse and looking at the nature of humans and the world and society. We can compare positive laws enacted by the government or that are enforced in a given society, and we can say we're going to hold these laws up to, to this light. So I can admit that there's a law against um, smoking marijuana in Texas right now. I can admit there's a law against evading my income taxes, okay? And then I can hold it up to what I would call libertarian rights, or you could some people call it natural rights, and I could say it's wanting. It doesn't. It doesn't match that. That's why it's unjust, and that's what you and I would say when we criticize a law. We say this law, yeah, it is a law, and it's wrong. For, it's wrong because it doesn't comply with our natural rights. Okay, so that's the kind of rational approach where you don't have any hesitation about. Admitting that something is a law – see a lot of libertarians are stuck in this legal positivism mentality where they get nervous if you separate the nature of law from some sovereign because – so for example, right, that's yeah. this income tax nuts. They just refuse to admit that it's illegal to evade income tax. They come up with all these crazy arguments why there's nothing in the tax code that shows you should do this or whatever, and it's like – I think they're wrong as a legal matter, but even if they're right, that's not the point. Even if there was something in the tax code that said you shouldn't um, uh, evade income tax, there's, it doesn't it, justify. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with admitting that it's a law, but then condemning it as the bad law. But you can only condemn positive law as a bad law or an unjust law if you 